Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Doctor Who Guide. I'm your host, Alex Patterson, and today I'm very excited to be joined by a very special guest, Philip Hawkins. Thanks so much for joining me. Hello. Avid viewers on the channel will remember that uh, about four years ago now, we did a crossover all about Doctor Who crossovers. We did a collaboration. That Thank was you. very, very exciting. <laughs> it was so long. It feels so long ago now. I've still got, you know, I made for that video that crossover machine. Yeah. It's still on, on my windowsill upstairs, very battered, falling apart and with a lot of dust on it, but I still have it. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> we have now both collaborated, though, on the unofficial 1997 annual put out by Trek with okay. distributors. So exciting to both have contributed short stories to this, and it's now available to order. And so I'm just, I'm so excited. I've gotten to get a sneak peek and read your story, and I absolutely loved it. So much oh, fun. You. you absolutely got the characters. You just threw them into a really, you know, entertaining situation. I enjoyed what references you you snuck in there. So if you had to pitch your story, uh, I just interviewed John Dorney and he said that a good Doctor Who story should be able to be summed up in one sentence. I'm going to oh, throw wow. you on the spot and say that if you were to Don't pitch your story, spot. spoiler free, uh, as a one sentence pitch, what would it be? Oh, I wish you'd prepped me for this. Um, <laughs> one sentence pitch. I'm not very good at these. It's the Doctor investigating some mysterious goings on in a dockyards where tea is imported and exported in the height of the during the height of the British Empire, and the tea has some mysterious effects on the local population. I think you nailed that to a T. Oh my gosh, uh, I got to throw that fun in there. It was Routine. very entertaining, yep. <laughs> very British topic. It really just set the tone. So I know that this is a very controversial topic, but what, in your opinion, is the best way to make tea? Because I know that as Americans, Ooh. we butcher it horribly, horrendously. Have you, um, do, you make so... tea? Do, you, do you drink tea? Well, uh, my family does. I am okay. not, unfortunately, a very a tea drinker. Her, her, I'm not a coffee tea. drinker. Tell me how they make it. <laughs> <laughs> So if you're going to have tea, you boil water, it comes in a bag, you put the water in your cup, you dunk your tea in it and let it steep, you know, like however long you want your tea, however strong you want your tea, okay. you dunk it in there. If you want milk, you add it. If you want sugar, you add it. How do you boil? Out. How do you boil your water? So we do it in a kettle. Um Okay. Oh, you've actually got a kettle. Oh, nice. That's yeah, impressive. Yeah. In America. <laughs> we will I, actually, and, and I, we will I, also microwave a regular one. Oh you know, no. We will microwave. That's, that's the cardinal sin. Never microwave. It saves it. time. <laughs> no. No. See, the kettle. I understand that kettles aren't prevalent in America, and there and there is a like a. I think there's a voltage issue. Your electricity has a lesser voltage, so you can't act. They don't actually work as well anyway. So I understand that. I'd like at least do it on the hob. Um, and yeah, you you don't you don't pour the water in the cup and then put the the uh, tea bag in. You pour the boiling water over the tea bag. Okay. So the tea bag, okay. put the tea bag in the cup with nothing else in it. Then pour the water on top. And there's debate about whether or not you add the milk before that or after that. But there you go. Right. That's my British take on tea. <laughs> Well, Never microwave you. it. It's that, <laughs> that's the sacrilege. <laughs> Never. All, all right. All right. Well, you know, I should say, you know, uh, we do have uh, it's not an electric kettle. I am not a tea drinker, not a coffee drinker. I'm a little child who likes hot cocoa. And that's that's what I'll drink <laughs> on the regular. But your story involved mysterious going on with tea. Was that the original pitch that you got? Was were there some ideas that you batted around when you reached out? No, it was actually somebody I knew who had written for these unofficial endings before and was involved in this one. Said, oh, I know you like the Eighth Doctor. Would you like to pitch for this annual? Um, and I was like, yes, absolutely. And I basically took what had been my uh, outline for a Paul Sprague entry from Big Finish that uh, obviously hadn't been successful and reworked that. Because originally it was a Eighth Doctor and Charlie story in my original pitch to Big Finish for it. So obviously I needed to change that because this annual was the remit was that all the stories had to have Stacey and Saad in it. But the, the original story kind of came about because Charlie was in it originally. And my I original idea came just it's just off the back of her being the Edwardian adventuress and me thinking and it just kind of sprung into my head. Oh, like 
oh yeah, you know, East India Company, that's all around about the same time. Might be interesting to do something tackling that. And, you know, she would be a avid tea drinker as an Edwardian person. So uh, it kind of sprung off of that. And then I just sort of reworked it to have Stacey and Saad in it instead. Which I think you did to a very good standard. It was very enjoyable in the way that you utilized them, gave them things to do. I mean, you know, historically, that's always been a difficult balance with more than one companion in the TARDIS. We saw in the Fifth Doctor era, they would literally, uh, you know, write out a companion for the episode because giving them too much to do would distract from one of the major plot lines. So are you a fan of the multi-fan TARDIS structure or do you prefer Doctor and one companion? I I like a multi-companion TARDIS team. I was really pleased when they started doing that in the classic, like in this or in the revival series again, because I am absolutely fine with one companion and the Doctor as well. But what I don't like is when it gets repetitive. And I thought in the original Russell T. Davis era, although he did very different things with each companion, it was the same sort of formula of Doctor and one companion every single time. So when Moffat started to mix that up a bit by having sort of Rory in there as well as Amy. I thought that was that was interesting. And I think having a mixture, so it's not a formula where every time there's a new companion or every time there's a new doctor, it's the same amount of companions. Doing away with having a formula for it makes it more interesting. So sometimes you have three companions like we did in the Jodie Whittaker era, but we've done that now. So let's this time, I think it's fine that we're going back to just Doctor and One Companion in um, with uh, Shooty series because we haven't had that for a while. But if it had been off the back of having it just happened, then I'd be a bit more like, oh, can we, can we do something different? So I do like it. Um, I think there are dangers with it. Like sometimes, like you said, they struggle to find something for all of them to do. And they, you know, write one out for an episode or something. But for the most part, I think having a TARDIS team, I quite like. Yeah, I think that, you know, as you say, it's all about the variety and, and changing things up. Having, I think, two companions in the Doctor really works because one of them can get split off and... You get your A plot and your B plot. And as we've seen that, that can definitely work. And you do kind of always need somebody to be following the doctor and saying, what is going on? You know, being that audience's view and key and asking those questions to the doctor. So I find that when you do have just the doctor and a companion and they get split off and you have your A and B plots, you still end up with a new character following the doctor around and going, "What what's going on? Help me out. You know, becoming the kind of role for the companion for the episode. So I suppose it's that trade off if you want that to be a regular character or if you want to have those kind of guest appearances where somebody becomes you know that pseudo companion for a day are there references that people should look out for in this story i know i caught a couple yeah i know i definitely did now here's the thing i haven't reread my own story since i wrote it and as you know but the people watching this might not this has been quite a long process i think i originally submitted my story about two years ago so it's been a while since i read it and i can't necessarily remember all the bits of it and everything i put in it (laughs) my memory isn't particularly great even with the stuff i've written so yes i do know that i definitely put in references to various things from the doctor's past but i can't actually remember what they are well i enjoyed it and i caught some and after this interview i'll be asking the ones you caught (laughs) Well, there was a reference that involved explosives, which I got, I I think, a a reference to the Seventh Doctor. And I feel like this story could have pitched a sequel that involves uh, a certain harbor and some throwing overboard of tea, um, which would... (laughs) Yeah. I I feel like I want to see a sequel. I remember submitting my story. I think it was... I started writing it on the last day of the deadline. (laughs) <laughs> and uh and i submitted it i think a couple days late but timely they they, they still took it um so how fast did your story come together i had what i had submitted to this paul sprag already which was a kind of synopsis a breakdown and i kind of think it's the first like i can't even remember how many hundred words they asked for now but it was like the first section but not the whole i hadn't written the whole story for that i just had a kind of rough idea of where it was going um and a lot of that changed just by the nature of, you know, removing Charlie and putting in Sard and Stacy, because they are not only uh, is one a giant hulking Martian <laughs> who, you know, 
can't maneuver around uh, 18th century Liverpool as um, much as Charlie could um, without being spotted. But also they're both from like different time periods. They're both from the future, uh, effectively. So they have different references and things. So it did change quite a lot. I do also tend to be somebody who works very last minute. Mm -hmm. Most of my uni work was done the night before it was due in. So I can't actually remember, but I'm fairly certain it would have been either similar to yours the night of or very close to the deadline because that tends to be how i work yes and i I remember it was june of 2021 was the probably the deadline for both of us so one of the things that i i really enjoyed was um being able to see the illustrations for my story have you been able to see the ones for your story i have yes they are fantastic i love them um and i love the ones because you sent me your story um Quite, I haven't had a chance to read it all because you sent it to me about an hour ago. Um, but uh, last I minute, did, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I did skim through it. Um, I read the first bit and I looked at all the illustrations. And yeah, the artists, the various artists they've got on this book are, are absolutely fantastic. And I love the love what they've done with it. Absolutely. And that's that's what's been so fun. And, and you know, the, the original annuals, there's a lot of, you know, a very visual aspect to them. And I love, you know, the artwork that uh, we've gotten in all of these and, and how the artists bring it to life. I, I was saying, you know, Chris Morola was the artist who did my illustrations. And it was so much fun because I maybe did, you know, a percent of the work by saying let's let's feature these characters this is the situation they'll be in and then the artist goes off and does all of this work and brings back this beautiful image and you just get to be like that's my story brought to life was that a similar experience to you just the the excitement of seeing your your characters did they get it right was there yeah. a lot of involvement I, the the i i beyond you know what i wrote on the page there wasn't any involvement from me so i there, there were things i described in the text obviously but beyond that the illustrations were completely out of my hands. But I don't want to, I'm trying not to give any spoilers for anybody that might go and read it, but there was, um, it's a Doctor Who story, so I don't think it's a spoiler to say there will be an alien presence involved. And, you know, how they represented that was pretty much exactly as I imagined it. And it was perfect, you know, just great. It looked absolutely fantastic. So exciting. And, and I just realized I need to make a correction because I, I think I mentioned Liverpool docks earlier, but I remember that I changed where I set it. So I think I set it in India in the end. So completely yes. different Um, because that was the original version, I think, where Charlie Pollard was set in Liverpool. And then I, I readjusted it. That's another thing I readjusted when I did the um, new version. Seeing how the different authors have worked with the constraints of a gigantic Ice Warrior as a companion and how that stands out. My story was set entirely within the TARDIS, so I didn't actually have that particular hurdle to to jump over. But I did enjoy kind of looking back at the, the stories that have been set in the TARDIS and, you know, try to throw together as many references as I could and get them in there in a way that was, you know, relevant to the story. Do you find when you're writing that did certain characters come to you? Let's say, let's talk about the Eighth Doctor. I think that you really captured his almost childlike energy and enthusiasm, but also mm. got the voice really, really well. I mean, we are dealing with a TV movie doctor as opposed to a Night of the Doctor doctor. Was it a lot of rewatching the TV movie for you? No, I think you know? I had him. I have him firmly in my head. He's been, I would say, the eighth, the eighth doctor is my doctor in the sense that he's the one I've associated most with, got the most expanded media for. When the TV movie came out in 1996, I was 10, so I was perfect age for it. So I kind of associate him as my doctor. And as a consequence, I've kind of latched onto that and, like, you know, collected the eighth doctor books. I've got all of the eighth doctor to audios and i've watched the tv movie a lot of times so i think i've got his voice in my head and like yeah i was very much trying to get him from the early stuff from tv movie and some of those early big finish ones where he's very much still light and jovial and he still is you know that all the way through to a degree but he does become he goes through the time war in in big finish and stuff and and there is a difference between him at the end and him at the beginning just trying to get that more playfulness in at the 
beginning, I think. The Eighth Doctor is kind of really a fascinating doctor in that because we just had the TV movie, there was no needing to conform to the plots that were happening on television. They could, for the first time, develop the Doctor's character beyond what the TV show was doing. In both the comics, in the books, in the audios, they kind of had a free reign to really develop the Eighth Doctor's character as much as they wanted yeah. to. And um, I think, yeah, I, and I think beyond just it being me being the right age when when it came about, just having that narrative gap, that huge unknown period of time in the Doctor's life, that was really interesting. More so than the stuff that came, like the expanded media stuff that came you slotted in between existing other stories, like a fifth Doctor story that comes between, you know, two fifth Doctor TV stories. Because you can't get much character development in something like that. But you can in the eighth Doctor life because it's all unknown and we don't know what happened to him in that time. So we can get a lot of character development and different media have gone different ways with it. If I ever finish the eighth Doctor and actually consume all of it and i've still got loads of the novels to read i've never finished reading the novels i've got comics to read still and and various other things i think i've listened to all big finish but my next thing would be to then go back and go well okay what stories are set after survival for the seventh doctor because that's got a similar thing to it in the sense right. that it's kind of an open book but yeah we know where he ends up in the beginning of the tv movie but between the end of survival and the tv movie that could be centuries of him developing and changing and he does from what i gather through big finish and the virgin new adventures novels a lot of that happened i've never really delved into those but i'd like to once i've finally eventually finish the eighth doctor there is so much out there and you're absolutely right i mean it's it was essentially that period between 1989 and the new series in 2005 was i mean it's collectively called the wilderness years and i think that in some ways it, it can looking back feel very sad because you know doctor was cancelled it was off the air but i think in a way it was a, almost a renaissance you know with those novel series with the seventh doctor and, and of course big finish starting up with their audios there was so much that was done to develop those characters and it'll give you quite the headache trying to put them all into chronological order and make them all talk for themselves because you know it, it's almost a joke in ace doctor timeline making the amount of times that his memory gets wiped uh, yep. that his adventures you know get rewritten uh or even directly contradict would you ever attempt a marathon that included books audios yeah i would comics? love to Oh, God, I might have to be when I'm retired because it would take so long. But I would love like I do have and I've spoken about this before on a, uh, various interviews and things. But I would love to one day create what I would call my Doctor Timeline bookshelf. And it would have every story of the Doctor in chronological order, but particularly the Eighth Doctor uh, was where I'd start. So, you know, you might have books interspersed with DVDs and novels and comics, just wherever they fit in his lifetime. So it's like his timeline, his chronology in order. And yeah, going through that would be interesting. It would take a hell of a lot of time, more time than I have at the moment, uh, spare to do it. I can't even get through the Eighth Doctor novels at the moment. I've gone back in after about a five year break of not reading one. I've picked one up recently and I'm now reading one again. So I'm going to try and power through and finish them. But that's taken me so far. I started reading the Eighth Doctor novels in 2005. So wow. <laughs> uh, wow. it's taken me a while to get about halfway through because I've taken oh long gaps. Uh, well, but for, for reference, that's you know there's a, about 70 am i correct uh, something you, like that yeah you can listen to a you know an hour-long audio in an hour obviously um but as a reader i tend to go at about i don't know a page a minute you can do right. other stuff while you're doing it you can't do anything yes. else while you're reading a book yeah. i listen to big finish audios while i'm doing the washing up while i'm driving the car while i'm on a train to work but i can't well I, I, I can read a book while i'm on the train to work but the you know can't do it while i'm washing up can't do it while i'm uh, driving so there's more opportunities to get through the big finish stuff than there is the books. It just takes more dedication and time. Wouldn't it be lovely if they had Paul McGann do audiobooks of the Ace Doctor Adventures? Oh, yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, anybody who's ever tried to read a book and do the washing up uh, knows that that makes it work. As soon as you need Don't to turn the pages, page, you're in trouble. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have a question for you. Had you read the Stacey and Saad comics? before embarking on this that's a great question i had 
because there was a Twitter thread that was going through, I think, chronologically, the Eighth Doctor's Adventures, and it mentioned these. And there was, a, I think, even a video upload. I think it was on YouTube. But then there were these, like, way back when machine links to, like, where you could see the comics. So I, I remember being, like, really excited to find out about them and to, to read them. And then for the annual, you know, they thankfully, uh, you know, included that as reference material in, in the writer's guide. But I hadn't, you know, read them in an absolute ages, but I did rely on them heavily when writing my story because I wanted the characters to be very much rooted in the events they'd experienced and my story, you know, tackles yeah. some of their greatest fears. And so I really wanted to get a kind of a good psychological profile. I was just so excited to to kind of embark on the new territory. Had you read, I take it you had not read the comics before that? I hadn't, no. I had encountered the characters before because they are in an Eighth Doctor book as well. They right. are in a novel where the eighth doctor goes to their wedding i believe um oh, does he no. go to their wedding so long ago since i read it i can't remember but either he goes to their engagement party or their wedding or something like that they've become a couple in there yeah. so we get a reference back so therefore we know that these take place before the novels do but we that go, was my we only encounter it into our that. timeline <laughs> yeah exactly so i know these will go before the novels in the timeline on the shelf but yeah i hadn't read them until like you say we got sent the reference material which was invaluable for just getting the characters and, and things although you know they were what six panel comic strips yeah. so you know serialized stories into six six panels each issue there's not a whole lot of characterization in there in the original ones because of the limitations of the format but i think you get enough to get a kind of uh, an idea of you know the main gist of these characters but then it also gives you a bit of freedom to it'll be interesting to see how we've all we interpreted them differently that'll be interesting right, right? it's definitely going to be fun because and invaluable i think for people who read the annual to get the most Stacy and Sard material that's mm. ever been combined all in one place. So that's going to be very exciting indeed. If you had to pick a companion that you think Stacy was most like and a companion that you think Sard is most like from, could be the TV show, could be the audios, you know, Sard is kind of like so-and-so. I don't know. Well, like, Sard well, is very... He's very unique. <laughs> very. <laughs> I don't unique. know. Is is there anybody else like Sard? Um, I've not read it, but didn't somebody have a Cyberman companion once? I guess that was... That was was yeah, that the eighth that doctor? Was, well? That was in the comics, yeah, with the eighth doctor. Comic. So maybe, maybe that just because of their unique. Stacy, she's from the future. She's got a bit of a uh, kind of like adventure spirit about her. I don't know. It's yeah. who would, who would you say? Mix. I think a bit of a bit of Amy Pond, um, in kind of the adventure spirit, and and obviously yeah. maybe just because Amy fell in love you know so i think that that's definitely there i think if you take the maybe just because i'm coming up with this you know as you say on the spot with these i think amy and rory are kind of a good image of the double act uh because i think that you know rory's very honorable very head over heels mm. in love with amy would do anything to protect her i think that that is kind of a good reference for sard if rory was a nice warrior <laughs> yeah yeah um <laughs> well he's been, a, he's been an autumn hasn't he? if you could pick another year for any of these annuals because obviously we got the 1997 annual what would be another year that you would fill in in the gap for the wilderness years there were yearbooks um, yeah, but I, you know, maybe between 1997 and 2004, what sort of a year would you pick? Would you do like a millennium one, like, a, you know, a, a 2000 annual? Um, yeah, that would be good. Because so, the, the thing with this one was, wasn't it? They picked Stacey and Zard partly because it, in that year, that was what the Eighth Doctor was doing. You know, he hadn't got to the books yet, I don't think. He hadn't, definitely hadn't got to Big Finish. So that's what the Eighth Doctor was doing. So what would the current be for, uh, I suppose it would be kind of predominantly Big Finish or the EVAs? If, if you were to do like with Char uh, Charlie, I think it would be cool to do a book that year with, uh, you know, Storm wanting yeah. him out. Storm and that was 2001. So the yeah. annuals would be set. You know, they're titled the a uh, certain year, but it's all about the year prior. So the 1997 annual comes out in 97, but covers everything that happened in 96. Yeah. So, so I, I think something with either Charlie or something with when Sam and... Fritz Kreener were both on the TARDIS. So because for a while yes. in the books, it was just Sam. And then it was Fritz joined as well. And I think they were quite good together. Yeah. So Storm Morning was 2001. So that would be like a 2002 annual. 
first appearance of Fritz Kreiner was The Taint. The Taint, and that came out in 1999. So again, that 2000 annual would be fun yep. to see. Eighth Doctor, Stacey and Sarv aside, where do you see the future of Doctor Who? There's so much going on. We've got the 60th coming. We've got mm. David Tennant back, 14th Doctor. We've got, you know, the 15th Doctor. Have you seen the pictures of the outfits that they have for... They look so sweet. good. <laughs> yeah, and the afro it. and the, the sharp suit. He looks great. He just looks great yeah. in almost everything. Like, at, I, you know, at some point, I'm just going to have to do a ranking of the, his various outfits because it seems in his first series, he's going to have a different outfit every episode. And Such a fun it, idea. It looks just so good. I think that's his best one so far. I just love it. The sharp blue pinstripe suit with uh, very 70s with the big lapels, the hair. Oh, I'm looking forward to that episode because the speculation is that that's going to be the same episode that uh, Jinx Monsoon is in. And of course, her costume got revealed the other day as well with the yes. piano kind of motif on it. And uh, the speculation is that it might be a musical episode, not confirmed, but speculated. I would love that. I It seems... Musical episodes of TV shows are very Marmite um, in the sense that you either love them or you hate them. And I love them. I love Buffy the Vampire Slayer once more with feeling that musical episode. I love the Flash's musical episode. That's the Flash. But I'm a big musical fan anyway, musical theatre fan. So I'm going to love that stuff. I like it best when it's an original score. They're brand new songs. Like, I don't really want them to do a jukebox musical where they just use pop songs and sing pop songs. So I'm really hoping it is a musical episode and it's a full on musical, not just like they sing one song, but it's like the whole episode is them bursting into song. I want I want that. <laughs> I want that too. I want it so bad. I'd love to see a Doctor Who musical. Have you heard the remake of a modern major general from the Colin Baker sings in a big finish audio? No, I haven't. Is that from the I've not the heard Pirates. it. Is that from the Pirates one. Yeah. Yes. yes. I've heard that it, that's a musical. Worth a listen and trying to sing the lyrics that they rewrote to fit that in. I mean, it's already a very, you know, difficult song to sing, but to to rewrite it in that way. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Um, right. I love that you, you know, you've always been, I think you've had a beat on Doctor Who news and always been a little bit more in touch with it than I have. Or at least when I see your videos, I'm like, you know, so much of what's going on. And I, I tend to just know the latest. So if if you could give one tip to anybody who's watching for how to keep up with the latest Doctor Who news. Yeah, I, I just get it off of Twitter. It's, it's all okay. it is. I've just, okay. I'm just keep an eye on Twitter. And then like I see people talking about it and like all the BBC releases some pictures. And I'm like, right. And I got, I've got the benefit of the fact that at the moment, I'm like a large amount of time I'm working from home. So if, if something releases like in the morning, if they release some pictures, I can use my lunch break that time to go up into my room and record a video, which, you know, if I was in the office, I wouldn't be able to do. So I've got that advantage. That's probably why you think I get them out quickly, because I just use my lunch break to make the video, which I'm in a fortunate uh, position to be able to do. It does make a lot of sense. I mean, being in, in the US, I'm five hours behind you. So I've got to wake up early. If yeah, that's a, true. Like, a lot of stuff, I'm guessing, just gets released <laughs> in the middle of the night for you. Yes, yes. Forbidden Planet's uh, merchandise launches uh, happen at 9 a.m. in the UK, which is a very reasonable time to send out an email or a newsletter. But I end up staying up till four in the morning, which is getting up at four <laughs> to be there for the news. I really appreciate all this time that you've spent talking about Doctor Who and your writing. I loved your story. I you. am so excited for it to be in the same annual. I'm honored to be in the same annual as your story. One last question for you. If you could write and insert an episode into any season of Doctor Who. Which season? But the catch is you'd have to swap it out for an existing episode. Oh, okay. See, that makes it more difficult because I was just going to, like, my... I kind of really want to write for the Eighth Doctor, so, and there isn't a season for the Eighth Doctor, so... <laughs> Can I replace the TV movie? <laughs> Can you rewrite the TV movie for us? <laughs> yeah, I'll rewrite the TV movie and do something completely different. I don't know. There's no, a I'd... petition to change a line about being half human. Uh, <laughs> I know. No, I'd better. fully embrace that just for the. You'd just make to, it three quarters human. <laughs> <laughs> You'd say he's fully human. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, he's been human the whole time. Just, uh, yeah, don't worry about it. Um, I really like Peter Capaldi's doctor as well. I'd say he's my second favorite doctor. In a way, he's kind of joined first 
with the eighth, but I just have more like emotional connection to the eighth. Yeah, probably maybe a series ten episode. Quite like Bill yeah. as character. Mind you, I like I like uh, Jenna Coleman's character as well. But yeah, mm-hmm. I'll go with series ten. I don't know which series one I would 10. take out. Is the annoying thing is it's a really strong season, so it's really hard to go. Oh, <laughs> you you made it hard one. for yourself. <laughs> yeah, I made it hard for myself, but I was just so that I could write for the Doctor and Bill and Nardo as well. It would be fun to write for. I think I'd probably replace Smile, which mm-hmm. was a good enough episode, but it had a weak ending. So I'd probably take that out. You'd get to write the you know second ever story for the for yeah, series 10. That, you know. that would be good. Yeah. Well, I look forward to hopefully more stories written by you in the future. And again, Philip Hawkins is an incredible channel. Oh, my gosh. We'll have to talk after the interview about the Picard finale. Have you seen that? Oh, yeah. Yet? We'll talk about that afterwards. But, you know, we'll stick to Doctor Who for this interview. Thank you so much for joining me today. I highly recommend checking out Philip Hawkins' YouTube channel and, of course, getting the 1997 annual to read his incredible story. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for having me.